Good evening and welcome to Galactic Terrors, an online reading series sponsored by the Horror Writers, of Associ Horror Writers Association New York chapter. Uh, I am Jim Chambers and here with me is Carol Geisander. Hi everybody. How are you, Carol? I'm doing well, thank you. It's, this is kind of exciting, especially doing yeah, it on Friday. <laughs> this is a, a, an unusual session for Galactic Terrors. We usually broadcast the second Thursday of the month every month. And this uh, month we bounced our reading to a Friday so that we could do this special um, session in conjunction with Heliosphere, which is a fantastic local convention here in New York uh, that takes place when we are allowed to get together in person up in Tarrytown, New York, in a very nice area. And this year it's happening virtual, uh, virtually. I think this is the second year that it's gone virtual. And we were really excited to team up with them to do a special Galactic Terrors. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of fun to think about it because the, we did our first online reading together at Heliosphere last year, a year ago. And that's actually what gave us the idea to start doing this, uh, this online series. So, you know, how fun to come back again, you know? Yeah. We're, yeah. Coming around full circle. Yeah. So I, I really would like to say, you know, welcome to all of our regular attendees. Welcome to everybody from Heliosphere who's watching us tonight. And also, uh, uh, I want to say hi and welcome to everybody from SFABC, the Science Fiction Association of Bergen County. This is one of our special events this month to tune in. So I know we have some folks in there as well. So hi, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yes, welcome. Uh, we hope you enjoy it, and we hope you'll consider coming back. Um, we'll have to do the uh, obligatory request that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, there should be a button just below the video that allows you to do that, and that will get you notifications for when we post uh, new broadcasts or live sessions. Uh, we also have a newsletter, mm -hmm. which Carol has been doing a fantastic job uh, administering lately, and there's a, uh, a URL there in the crawl that you can go to if you would like to sign up and get regular updates. Mm -hmm. And we'll drop that in the chat in a little bit as well. Yes. Uh, so it's easier to click on. But and we, we don't spam. We, we only send two things a month about the uh, the events coming up. So you can trust us with your um, with your email address because I spent 15 years as a Boy Scout leader and 12 years as a Girl Scout leader. So Scouts Honor, we will not spam you. <laughs> That's it. We just want you to know who's reading and when we're broadcasting. Mm -hmm. So you can come by and, uh, and join us. And we also want to give a special uh, thank you to Gabby Morell, Monet Johnson, and Liz Creffin, and all of the crew at Heliosphere for helping us uh, pull this together. And several of our HWA New York chapter members will be on panels this weekend. And we're excited, as always, to be part of Heliosphere. We've had a great time there in the past. And uh, we appreciate all of the, the work that you are all putting into making this happen. Mm -hmm. It's it's true. Uh, you know, you guys have really pulled this together uh, tremendously well. So it's very exciting. So uh, those who have not joined in on Heliosphere can uh, join and, and attend the rest of the convention for free. It goes on on Saturday and Sunday as well. Uh, so um, I recommend you, you know, check it out. There's some cool stuff coming up. And we'll put the link to that in the chat as well. Yeah. As we go along. Uh, also on the convention scene coming up in May, the Horror Writers Association is doing StokerCon 2021 as a virtual convention this year. We originally had planned to hold it in person in Denver, Colorado, and for very obvious reasons, we had to rethink those plans. And it will be taking place May 20th to the 23rd. Uh, you can find out more information about that at StokerCon 2021.org, uh, which is the official con website, or at horror.org. And that will be full of presentations, panels, workshops, readings. Uh, it will include the Bram Stoker Award Ceremony for, mm -hmm. the, for the 2020 awards. And it will include the final frame short film competition, which is always a highlight of the convention that will be taking place on the Friday night of uh, StokerCon. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm thrilled to see those because there's so much moody stuff. There's so much spooky stuff. There's so many interesting little things that I, I don't get to see otherwise. So I'm excited for that. That'll be fun. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, as one of the people who's helping to organize it, I can tell you there's some really great surprises in store. We have a terrific uh, roster of guests of honor that includes Joe Lansdale, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, uh, Maurice Brodus, Sean and McGuire, um, 
Steve Rasnick Tem. And who am I forgetting? There's one more. <laughs> I always do this. There's always one that slips my mind. Uh, Lisa, Morton, Lisa Morton, who was uh, oh, yeah. read with Galactic Terrors for our very first session last September. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Queen of Halloween. Yeah. I, I, it's also worth I'm looking forward to the convention. I, I really am. You know, the, the, the horror community through HWA is one of the most friendly and welcoming groups that I have come across. And I, frankly, I'm writing more horror just because I like the HWA folks. Is that silly? But, you know, they, that's cool. It's cool. No, we're, we're fun to hang out with. We get all of our, uh, our, our scary stuff out on the page on the page and so in person we're all very mellow and well adjusted right <laughs> yes yes really none of us have skeletons in our house you know exactly yeah or floating randomly in space <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah that's true hey you know one thing that would be really helpful to us is we've been building an audience for this um uh event for galactic terrors if you guys could drop in the chat how you heard of us that would be really useful for us to to keep an eye on and, and learn you know we've got the newsletter we put stuff out on facebook and we you know we post it in various uh sites uh in the new york area and online but i'd love to hear how you heard about our event so let us know thanks yes that would be very helpful thank you so all right so what i what i guess people are really interested though uh in though tonight is who's reading tonight we have a, a fantastic lineup mm -hmm. uh, we're featuring uh, a few members from the local chapter um, who are longstanding uh, chapter members, HWA members, horror writers, uh, as well as writers in other genres. And we have uh, a special guest, Ryan Aussie Smith, coming uh, from the, the remote wilds of, of Kansas. And uh, <laughs> the rest of us are all here in, in uh, you know, downstate New York, where uh, it's wild, but not remote. <laughs> and that, that uh, list includes Teal James Glenn, Amy Greck, and Randy Dawn. Cool. Great crowd. Great crowd. So, you know, one of the things I like about hearing the author read their own work is that it's much more personal to the author. But we're going to hear a little bit more from Ryan in a little while because he's also a, a, a voiceover artist. So, you know, we're, we're going to hear a little bit more about that coming. So that'll be fun, too. Yes. Excited. Yeah. All right, so shall we, we dive into the readings for the evening? Yes, please. I can't wait. Very good. All right. Uh, reading first tonight is Ryan Aussie Smith. Ryan is an Australian poet, author, and voice actor. He co-authored the Everly is Everywhere series of children's books and is currently co-publisher of Space and Time magazine, dedicated to publishing the best in semi-pro fantasy, horror, and science fiction since 1966. His latest book release is Shadow's Lament, which he will be reading from today. Find out more about Ryan at ryanaussiesmith.com. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Down Under Plains of Kansas, as uh, as they said earlier. Uh, this is Ryan Ozzy Smith reading from Shadow's Lament, my new dark fantasy novel. So we enter a scene where Thorn, our protagonist, has been captured by a band of unknown mercenaries. Thorn charged the closest man, but his injured leg did not obey fast enough. Pain again shot through him, this time emanating from his uninjured leg. It caused him to misstep and go sprawling on all fours. He glanced back to his uncooperative limb to see a large hunting knife, also sticky with a black toxin protruding from his leg. It was buried to the hilt in completely immobilized movement. Scanning the darkness behind him, Thorn could make out a broad-shouldered silhouette. It approached the light of the campground, spinning a glintering blade like a toy. It's all right, lads. I stuck him with blades dipped with parthic. He'll be dropping off soon, he said in an accent that Thorne had never heard before. The man took a few more confident strides forward and was dimly illuminated by the fire. He had a wide-brimmed leather hat with animal fangs adorning its straps. The hat sat high on a tangled mass of mousy brown medium-length hair. 
that would break a comb if any comb dared to go near it. A bemused expression covered the man's face, along with many scars, some of which appeared to have claw marks through them. It was difficult to judge the man's age, as he appeared young, yet his wrinkles but had wrinkles when he smiled. Sun-battered skin had had uh, turned the once white skin now a polished wooden brown. He wore a blue cotton shirt rolled up at the sleeves with dark blue trousers and heavy leather boots. The unremarkable clothing was quickly forgotten when Thorn studied the leather bandoliers crossing the man's chest. They were lined with short and long throwing knives and many small vials of uh, suspicious-looking liquids. At his waist hung a large hunting knife, the twin to the one currently skewering Thorn's leg. The man continued his advance and, without breaking stride, bent down to pick up a thick piece of wood. Frightful images of what that man would do with his newly acquired wood sprung to Thorne's minds. Ripping the knife out of his palm, Thorne launched it directly at the smiling man's head. It hurtled through the air, spinning it over and over end. Thorne was certain it would hit its mark, but instead of flesh, the knife bit into the wood. The smiling man had raised the piece of wood like a small shield and caught the blade. Letting out an impressed whistle, he wiggled the blade free and from the wood, wiped it and slid it back into his bandolier. Fair dinkum, mate, you're bloody quick. Nice return, he said through a mouthy grin. He turned. Hey, Robbo, what did that letter say? He's one of them queer magic types? Thorne could hear the sigh of frustration in the direction of the campfire and the leader's voice now identified as Robbo. It's Mr. Robinson to you, savage, and yes... The letter pins him as an abnormal, which was always a possibility. Thorne became aware that he was once again paralysed, but had remained upright and propped on one elbow. The numbness spread swiftly this time, causing his head to swim as the conversation continued. Well, shit, Robber, I reckon that little tidbit of info could have been pretty handy during the hunt. He mobilised the Parthic in roughly eight hours. You pelicans could have told me sooner. I would have cooked up something stronger. Then your man's face wouldn't have been tenderized, and the voices faded as warm numbness washed over Thorn. It felt like the midday sun after emerging from a cold stream. Thorn embraced it. All went dark. Thorn woke to blackness, but it wasn't the only thing on his mind. The deep ache of stiffness within his joints took precedent. Without opening his eyes, Thorn twisted his hands, willing the frost freezing his movement to melt. Mind still hazy and memory riddled with holes, Thorn tried to make sense of where he was and what had happened. Cracking open his eyes slowly, he took in the scene. He was lying on his stomach, on what appeared to be a rock outcropping. Based on the sun's position, it was either close to dawn or dusk, and the twilight Thorn couldn't tell the difference. Next to him, only a few feet away, lay the flamboyant knife thrower he heard called Savage. Savage had a stern look on his face, but when he turned to see Thorn awake, it transmuted to a wily grin. G'day, mate, said Savage through a brimming smile. Hope you enjoy the little buzz I mixed into the Parthic toxin. I thought to myself, shit, Savage, you're going to be knocking this kid out for a few hours anyway. Might as well make it make him as high as a kite and loosen him up a bit. Anyway, easier to transport someone who likes you. How'd you like it? Good times, yeah? Savage looked towards Thorn expectantly, as if he'd done him some great favour. Before Thorn could respond, Savage looked over the rock outcropping and beckoned. Righto, mate. You're going to want to shimmy up here and take a gander. I'm not ro- if I'm not wrong, you're going to like this. Shimmy? Gander? Thorn understood the gist of what the man was saying, but thought maybe Savage had enjoyed a few too many little buzzes of his own. Itching himself, inching himself towards the edge of the rocky outcrop, Thorn noticed that his body felt only slightly numb and that thick iron manacles had replaced the rope at his hands and feet. Smart move, thought Thorn, remembering the quick work he had made of the rope bindings. Now, at the edge of the outcrop, Thorn followed the direction of Savage's gaze and saw the scene he had just been a part of. A small campfire was surrounded by seven men dressed in matching dark black military uniforms. Each possessed a crossbow that hung loosely by their sides. They appeared to be setting up camp for the night. Sitting close to the fire, one man barked orders relentlessly, complaining for the sake of hearing his own voice. 
He lifted himself stiffly from the seat and headed for a patch of trees just outside the fire's light. A stream of pointless grousing followed his steps. Thorn looked to Savage with puzzlement, edged on his face. Just wait a sec, he said. Ha, here they come. Without looking away from the camp, Savage smiled wider. A roar, deep and angry, filled the still night air, followed by a throaty clicking noise. The clicking stopped as a small, as a tall tree, just a silhouette against the sky, appeared to shake, rise a foot, then fly in the campfire's direction. It struck several men and crushed them immediately. From the darkness, three lumbering beasts, each the size of a wagon, roared and hooted. They charged the men surrounding the campfire. The creature swung clubs with huge oversized arms, pounding the ground like angry baboons in mating season. In the dying firelight, Thorn could see their dark shapes, but the way they moved reminded him of the large cotton mane gorillas of the western woods. The men were quickly overwhelmed, letting loose a few crossbow bolts which the beast ignored. Muscles are usually docile creatures when they're not in the colony, but if you park your camp a stone's throw away from their home, they're going to throw stones at you, or in this case, a tree. Thorn shot a glance of confusion towards Savage as the man continued to laugh. He stopped abruptly when he saw Thorn's look. Huh, you think I'm backstabbed? Well, mate, they shat the bed three times, he said. One, I was hunting you, and they withheld information, important information from me. Not good. Two, I said I could get you without killing too many people. Most of the lads in your convoy were green as spring grass and didn't need to die. They killed them all anyway, which is just messy and unprofessional. And three, I learned you were worth more cash than they were paying me and they didn't want to renegotiate. And that's why they're all dead now. Stingy bastards. By the end of his rationalising, Savage had a sober tone that spoke of the portrayal he felt. His eyes then turned to the hooting massacre which signalled the return of his manic smile. Thorn decided this was not a man to provoke if you valued your life. Savage's words, uh, words and unique code of honour suggested to Thorn it was best to shut up and do as he was told until he knew the man and the situation better. The commotion continued down below, and both spectators continued their silent observation. There were no screams, except the inhuman ones reverberating from the muscle lips, followed by more of the throat clicking. Even when a man's limbs were plucked like the wings of a fly at the hands of, the malevolent, of a malevolent child, there were no screams of pain. The entire party was either dead or unconscious, and soon to be dead. As far as Thorn could see, the muscle creatures were not eating the men, just ripping them apart. It was confusing but not relevant to his personal situation. Using twisted logic, Savage has had justified exacting revenge against his former companions for the unprofessional bloodshed of Thorn's caravan. Thorn felt strangely indebted. And that's the end of my reading today. Wow, that is exciting. So much stuff going on just in that one passage. Very cool. Yeah, like and like I was saying earlier, I it's a dark fantasy novel. Uh, it has uh, elements of, of darkness in there, but uh, uh, I was I was thinking, hmm, we've got a whole bunch of horror writers. I've got to find something a little bit gruesome, throw it in there because, as you said, ah, oh, I like the horror writers. I like a little bit of blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we do have skeletons in our in our house. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fun. Absolutely. That's fun. Now, I, I like the description of, of all the characters that you were doing as well. You know, mm. I mean, just the fa just the list of the armaments that one guy is carrying tells us a whole lot about him, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that that characters like they they always say that you write uh, you know personal experiences, and for some reason I've got like a crocodile Dundee character that just randomly popped up in my story. So that uh, kind of says a lot about me. Well, you know, we actually have a question from our audience from Angela. Mm-hmm that we can put up. Um, who did you model the gruff Australian character? Do <laughs> you know personally? Uh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I I am not wearing the hat right now, but generally uh, my my persona or my, uh, my look is to have a cowboy hat, which, uh, you know, when I look in the mirror, this is the man I see and it is true. So we'll just go ahead and 
and base it on that. <laughs> okay, that, that sounds like a, a fair admission. That, that's kind of cool, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I have actually an interesting question for you. Yeah. This book sounds really cool, and it does mm -hmm. sound, there's clearly these graphic scenes in here, but you yeah. also write, wrote some children's books and such. How, how does that work for you? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, me and my wife, we uh, she's she's she got me into writing. Um, she's like, oh, you're you're creative. You can probably put some words down on some paper. Um, so she she got me into writing. Angela, the one who just asked the question, um, and uh, yeah, when we were down in in Florida, um, living for a while, we we noticed that there was a a lot of uh, grandparents, uh, a lot of kids, mm -hmm. and different things like that. So we we're like, hey, um, you know, children are fun and. Uh, like children's books, we've got a lot of imagination. Um, let's let's try and write a couple of children's books together and see how we go. So specifically with Everly is Everywhere, um, that that came from uh, uh, us wanting just to just have a, a character that could just go into different situations and experience them and just put them in in random spots. So Everly travels all over the world, um, experiencing different situations and and just kind of educating. And it's a yeah, Everly's this little blue cute mouse. Um, that uh, that we animated up and uh, and yeah so just with the the children's books we we thought yeah we, we there might be a market for it down there we enjoy writing them and uh, and that's how that came about. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of cool because people uh, like to buy a book from somebody local so why not? Yeah yeah absolutely and that that was uh, that's kind of how it came about. We had our own own novels and we were selling them and we're just like, hey, you wanna you wanna see some dead people? Read this book. And uh, we had a whole bunch of uh, little old grandmas and grandpas going, do you have any children's books that aren't scary? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we're like, uh, no, but we but we can. So then Angela was writing up uh, the uh, literary lizard, which is uh, another children's book. We we just we did a whole bunch. We actually have one uh, one out that I, I really love the illustrations. It's very uh, kind of Disney gothic, and it's called uh, Monsters Are Everywhere. Um, it's oh, up yeah. on Amazon, and uh, it is a, is a I love the message. Um, we have monsters are everywhere, and and uh, spiders are everywhere. And uh, the monsters are everywhere. It essentially says monsters are everywhere regardless, but you're scarier than them. So you don't need to be afraid. Um, and for those of us that uh, are horror um, enthusiasts, yeah, that's that's part of it. If, if you know about the monsters, then you can defend against them. So don't mm -hmm. be afraid of them. Just, you know, get more knowledge. Yeah, I think one of the big things that scares us is the unknown. And that that's mm. why so many creepy scenes come in a horror you know, movie or a, a story, because there's little mm. dribbles coming along that you don't know what it is, you don't know what it is, you don't know what it is. Yeah, the scariest monsters are the ones you don't see. Then you get the reveal and you're like, oh, well, that's not interesting. Yeah, anymore, it's, but... Stephen King's, it's a giant spider that squirts out ketchup and mustard. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's so much more scary when it's just skittering noises through the vents and you're not sure because our imaginations are always worse than... Uh, than what the the monsters actually are, and that's yeah, that's true. Okay, then just tell me real quick. You're doing you're doing all this cool stuff with space and time, the two of you, and and a bunch of other folks as well. Yes, yes. So we just uh, we recently, um, due to the uh, the pandemic and and everything going on with that, we changed our space and time publication uh, to a print on demand. So mm -hmm. uh, previously we had a, a printing press here locally within uh, Kansas City that we were going mm -hmm. to and we were mailing everything out. But uh, obviously with all the fun and games of the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. that was no longer a feasible option. So we went to uh, we now have it up on Amazon. So um, it's faster. It's it's we're finding much, much better when it comes to shipping uh, because the the logistical side of it, Amazon is quite good at shipping things out. We were using USPS oh. and a lot of that stuff was going missing, especially the international ones, which were like, you know, $30 for shipping. Um, mm. So the print on demand is, is working really, really well. Um, we are... Um, doing uh, audio versions of the magazine as well. Um, when you were saying earlier for me doing voiceover work, I uh, voice the magazine, um, mm -hmm. individual stories and everything like that. So the uh, the, the most recent is uh, 140 that just recently came out, mm -hmm. uh, spaceandtime.net, you can, you can find that. Um, and I do have the audible version of uh, 139 um, up on Amazon. Um, and you can get that free if you have a, um, the audible subscription um and that's up there as well um cool. and yeah cool oh that's terrific mm -hmm. well listen i really appreciate it i know you're taking a little time away from work and i'm glad it wasn't a busy time so you could talk to us and such yeah yeah if, if you're free at the end of, of our show i'd love to have you come back and talk with the rest of us uh, about some other things coming up but uh yeah. 
Yeah, but thank I'll you do my that. absolute best to, to get back on and uh, and yeah, we can have uh, some more conversations. Yes, we can conversate. Conversate. Made it a verb. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like a writer, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not a not a languager. It's it's fine. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. You're I'm going to go welcome. ahead and introduce our next reader, who's Amy Grick. Amy has sold over 100 stories to various anthologies and magazines, including a New York State of Fright, Apex Magazine, Beat to a Pulp, Hard Boiled, Dead Harvest, Dead Man's Tome, Campfire Tales, Book Two, Expiration Date, Flashes of Hope, Fright Mail, Fright Mare, Hell's Heart, and Hell's Highway, and Hell's Mall. Needle Magazine, Scary to Sleep, Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, Tales from the Lake Volume 3, The One That Got Away, Thriller Magazine, and many others. New Pulp Press published her book of noir stories, Rage and Redemption in Alphabet City. She's an active member of the Horror Writers Association and the International Thriller Writers who lives in New York. You can connect with Amy on Twitter at uh, Amy underscore Grek or visit her website, crimsonscreams.com. Amy. Hi, everyone. It's National Poetry Month, so in honor of that, I'm going to read two of my poems, and then if there's time, a flash, flash fiction piece. So first up, from Hell's Mall, is my poem, Orange Julius. An iconic sweet treat and a melee of bullets unexpectedly meet. Vermilion froth, tart and sweet, the perfect treat when you need a break from the endless storefronts in the suburban mecca vying for your attention and hard-earned dollars. Ceaseless foot traffic, a steady stream, perfect for an orange dream, things aren't always as they seem. Married couples bicker, cigarette butts flicker, burning bright like miniature suns. Neon lights delight a mother and her daughter holding a red balloon. Childlike whimsy on display at KB Toys. Something for all the boys, girls and boys. Orange dream, things aren't always as they seem. Teenagers canoodle, kids play with pool noodles in a ball pit. Management doesn't give a shit. As you hit rock bottom, you've got a short fuse and nothing to lose. You had a good job at a store on the second floor, Walden Books. You loved the work, but your boss was a real jerk, didn't care. He said you stared at the customers, did as you pleased, and put them ill at ease. With that, you were fired, so you conspired. You took your father's gun, a police-issued thirty-eight snub-nosed Smith & Wesson revolver, out of your trench coat, taking aim at everyone. Bullets rain down, a lethal hailstorm hitting their mark. The world goes dark as hapless shoppers fall like dominoes, riddled with pinpoint precision holes, spouting blood amongst the incessant shouting. As their shopping bags crumble and they wither like flowers cut down before full bloom. The, the little girl with the, wet, with the red balloon along with her mother Promising lives ended too soon. All right. And next up is a very short poem from A New York State of Fright. This was our chapter anthology. It came out, I believe, in 2018. So here's my poem, Machine Gun Latte. Poised and ready, a tall, lean National Guard soldier dressed in full camouflage regalia stands at attention on the main concourse of Penn Station in New York City. In his right hand, he clutches a latte, frothy and warm, in a white Starbucks cup. His left hand hovers above a machine gun slung over his shoulder, cold and commanding, sleek and menacing. His trigger finger twitches, roused by a jolt of caffeine, fuel for the fight. All right, that was a real short one. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And um, next up, I'm going to read a flash fiction piece that was published recently in the Flashes of Hope anthology. I did not get my uh, contributors' um, copy yet in the mail. So um, here we go. This is Perishables, February 14th, 2021, 12 a.m. Here in my cool concrete cocoon, Marking the days on the wall with pink ch chalk is the only way to keep time now that the power's out. Happy Valentine's Day. My name is Placido Sanchez, and I'm sitting hunched over a rickety card table in the basement of my modest house, scribbling this in a dog-eared notebook with a pencil, squinting as I write by the dim glow of a kerosene lantern purchased from the mall. Ravenous, I surrendered to a voracious hunger, a need to feel full under the guise of normality. There's comfort in routine, no matter how mundane. At first, I devoured perishable food, milk, ice cream, cold cuts, cheese, fruit, and vegetables, stored in the freezer, running on a propane-powered backup generator that lasted a mere 72 hours before switching to canned and freeze-dried provisions, my last resort after the bombing that obliterated my family and everything else. I'd been reduced to eating tasteless canned food that had been sitting untouched for months on the verge of rotting, scarcely fit for human consumption, but a source of sustenance nonetheless. I can't bear another can of bland baked beans. My stomach growls loudly in protest. I yearn to taste fresh meat. I lick my lips in anticipation and sigh. I kick the last unopened can across the floor. It lands with a loud hollow clang against the massive pile of empty cans, bottles, and boxes strewn in the corner. Julia's remains are a perfect distraction from the incessant boredom that plagues me, a bountiful feast to engage my senses. I had been consumed by her passion long ago. Now my beloved Julia would be consumed by my insatiable hunger. She would have wanted it that way. It would bring us together again, body and soul. With a heavy heart, I slice pale pink meat into thin translucent strips with a chef's knife also from the mall. My tears run down Julia's cheeks as I set them down on a dish of fine bone china. I chew each morsel slowly, relishing the poignant flavor of my meal, fresh off the bone. My mother's, my wife's thighs contain the sweetest meat I'd ever tasted. I shove the dish that Julia never got to see aside and wipe my sweaty hands on my tattered jeans. I already devoured the succulent meat on her rump, arms, breasts, lower legs, toes, and fingers. I now have newfound respect for finger food. I remove the diamond ring from her ring, the ring finger on Julia's left hand, kept as a memento out of respect, and slip it on my pinky. The precious gem sparkles in the dim light, a reminder of the decade of bliss we shared, so fleeting. My iPhone battery wavers. It stubbornly refuses to hold the charge for more than a few hours. There's no one left to call, but the cell signal has become very weak. I don't remember the last time I've seen the sun, but I have a lantern, the, a poor substitute. There isn't any running water, though I still have several gallon jugs to tide me over but none of the comforts of home. The morning of the bombing, I drove to a nearby mall to pick out birthday presents for Julia, a set of Chicago cutlery and the bone china she always wanted. I picked up the lantern on a whim, foresight. I remember when the bomb dropped, six o'clock on a Sunday night, a direct result of mounting tension between Cuba and the United States regarding their right to occupy our airspace. In retaliation, they unleashed their nuclear arsenal. I was grilling hot dogs and hamburgers in our backyard in New Mexico, next door to the Air Force Base, a prime target, 
when Julia kept Juan and Maria company at the picnic table nearby. They were playing cards, gin rummy. Juan's eyes lit up when he won for the first time. He grinned while his feet dangled in the air. Not used to losing, his little sister pouted and knocked the entire deck to the ground. We remembered to get the buns and rolls out of the basement pantry just before the hamburgers and hot dogs burned, and Julia and I rushed into the house. She ran down the stairs too fast. The heel of her shoe got caught and she tumbled headfirst to the concrete floor below. By the time I reached my love, her neck was already broken. At that moment, I heard the explosion outside. I screamed and clutched my lifeless wife in my arms, unable to accept the cruel blow fate had dealt me. I wanted to give Julia a proper burial in the background, but backyard, but radiation prevailed, so that wasn't possible. Instead, I preserved her body in the walk-in freezer, her final resting place, until I needed her to keep me going. I closed my eyes and pictured the gigantic mushroom cloud, an immense fiery burst of lethal nuclear energy, instantly annihilating everything in its path, including my beloved children. I envisioned the hot dogs, the hamburgers, the baked beans, and the macaroni salad Julia made, burnt to a crisp, being devoured by ants, bit by bit. And that's all I've got for you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amy. You're welcome, Jim. Can I tell you how much I miss Orange Julius? <laughs> yes, yes, I know. I grew up with it. You probably did too, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there used to be an Orange Julius, uh, coincidentally, in Penn Station. Uh, oh, yeah, for that's many right. years. Yes. Yeah. And so, so that was my go-to on the way home from uh, from work or just, you know, in and out of the city grabbing Orange Julius. I was so disappointed when it closed down eventually. Yes. So, But um, I'm sensing a bit of a theme here tonight. I wonder if you, you did this on purpose or if it was just uh, – synchronicity but um this was sort of like the dark side of of food and beverage <laughs> <laughs> exactly it, it was a little bit of synchronicity because the um poem and holes hell's mall is short and so carol emailed me and said do you have anything else and i said well my very short poem in a new york state of fright in honor of uh national poetry month right right and um then um I timed those out earlier today, and that was about six minutes between the two poems. So I have that short I just read from uh, the Flashes of Hope anthology, which also is food related. So yeah, just sort of work, worked out a happy coincidence. That's great. Yeah, I love it when stuff comes together like that unexpectedly. Definitely. So now, you, Amy, you've, uh, in your bio, it mentioned you've published more than 100 short stories. Mm -hmm. And I know you've written novellas, too. Um, have you written a novel? Have you published a novel? I did, actually, way back in the year 2000, um, back when self-publishing was kind of shunned. It was this company called Ex Libris. Um, they actually had an ad in the Village Voice, oh. and I uh, submitted my um, novel that way. It's called The Art of Deception. It's still available on uh, Amazon, I do believe. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you prefer writing short fiction to to novels, and short fiction and poetry? I should say. Uh, I I <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not biased, if you will. Um, I just have sort of um, honed my craft a little more in that um, arena of writing. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, I've had a couple of novellas published as well. It just um, matters. It, it's sort of goes with what's happening in my life at the time. Um, that poem from a New York State of Fright, I actually wrote in Penn Station, um, catching a train to Long Island to visit my family um, because I wrote it in the year 2002 when they had the National Guard soldiers still standing guard. And one of them had the latte from Starbucks, well, I don't know if it's a latte, but a coffee. Then he had his machine gun, and I thought that was uh, an interesting uh, juxtaposition. 
So, yeah, um, it was it was always interesting to see those guys on duty in Penn Station, and they were there. I think they're still there to some extent. I haven't been into the city for a while with the pandemic mm-hmm. going on, but yeah, uh, they they became sort of a permanent fixture after after nine eleven. They did, and uh, you know, National Guardsmen with with automatic weapons and uh, the the fancy SWAT police units with dogs, the canine units, and everything, and. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of inspiration there. So we, we have some questions coming in from the audience. Um, but I just I had one more question for you before we, we jump to those. Okay. Um, you've been writing for a long time and you've mm-hmm. published a lot. And, you know, I think we all know as authors that, uh, you know, writing and publishing can be kind of a or seem like an uphill uphill uh, slog a lot of the time. You know, there's waiting for responses. There's rejection, of course. There's. The publishing process, which can be very slow, even when stuff is accepted, it takes, you know, it can take a long time to come out. What, mm-hmm. what do you find has been the biggest um, element of your success over such a long period of time and with so many pieces of writing? Just um, if something gets rejected to uh, go back to the story or the poem and, and read it and see what what didn't work. And usually um, I'll put it aside for a couple of weeks and come back to it with a fresh eye. And then I can usually um, fix it. And uh, then it's usually accepted at another market or maybe two mar- it goes through two markets before it's accepted. So um, I find um, comments from editors are always very helpful. But of course, they don't always have time for personalized comments as far right. as rejection. Yeah, so it's it, so it sounds like really the key is just keeping keeping with it, persistence, and yes, keeping the stories out there for submission. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. Well, we we have a question from Nancy. Okay. And she would like to ask you the classic. What scares you? Oh boy, it's kind of like, do you mean pre-pandemic or or now? But um, we'll go with with pre-pandemic. Um, just, I mean, it's a cliche, but just like fear of rejection, you know, like not, not with my writing, but in real life, you know, like if, if I like, um, a guy and, and it turns out uh, I find throughout the grapevine, he has a girlfriend and then obviously he's not fair game anymore. And, you know, things like that are, are kind of, I, I take them too close to heart. I have to to build a tougher skin for that sort of thing. All right. And we have a question from Carol. Okay. And she'd like to know if you prefer reading short stories or novels. I read more novels um, and the occasional anthology, not just ones that I have stories in, but with my my own reading for pleasure, it, it does tend to be more often novels that I'll read. Cool. Excellent. Have you read any recently that you would recommend? Uh, definitely Tender is the Flesh. Um, again, we're going with the food theme. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's a very um, meaty, heartbreaking story without um, spoiling the twist. I, I do recommend it. Tender is the Flesh. Who wrote that? Oh, gosh. The author's name escapes me. Um I could Google it really quick, but I would I would just say to people out there, just just Google it or go to Amazon. Sorry, I should have. No, that, that's OK. I'm, I'm sure it's easy enough to find. That's a distinctive title. Yes, indeed. Great. All right. Uh, Amy, thank you so much for reading tonight. We'll uh, we'll have you back on at the end with the whole crew to do some more Q&A and talk about what everyone has coming up next. All right. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right, so I'm uh, happy to introduce our next reader. Uh, of all of the bios I have to read uh, for Galactic Terrors or for other things, uh, for all the bios I've had to compile for various purposes, I have to say that I enjoy Teal's perhaps the most simply because of how it begins. Teal James Glenn has killed hundreds and been killed more times on stage and screen as he has traveled the world for 40 plus years as a stuntman, swordmaster, storyteller, bodyguard, actor, and haunted house barker. His short stories have been printed in over 100 magazines, including Weird Tales, Mystery Weekly, Pulp Adventures, Spine Tingler, Mad, 
Fantasy Tales, Sersova, Sherlock Holmes Mystery, and Blazing Adventures. His latest novels are A Cowboy in Carpathia, a Bob Howard adventure, which is also winner of the best novel in the Pulp Factory Awards from Pro Se Productions, and The Skull Mask Chronicles from Bold Ventures, Bold Venture Press, and Killing Shadow from Airship 27 Productions. He is also the winner of the 2012 Pulp, Pulp Arc Award for Best Author. His website is theurbanswashbuckler.com. Uh, join me in welcoming Teal. Hello. Uh, what I'm going to read is from Cowboy in Carpathia. Now, Robert E. Howard was a man who created Conan the Barbarian, among other iconic figures. He all but invented the sword and sorcery genre. He only lived 30 years, and he took his own life while his mother was dying in a coma in a hospital. He'd never traveled very far from his cross plains to Texas, Texas home, but his tales of adventure span time and space. In the book, I postulate what might have happened if he lived and traveled. And in the course of that, he meets a young woman by the name of Gwendolyn Harker, who, while trying to find her heritage in Transylvania, is taken prisoner by a certain nobleman you may or may not recognize. The first teen t scene takes place about halfway in the book. The darkness had settled on Pest with an abruptness, and with it came an eerie silence as the city dwellers, now all aware of the series of murders, despite the lack of official confirmation, shuttered themselves in their homes. No one walked the streets save the police force, now at full alert and walking in pairs. The pale that fell over the town was thicker than the fog that crawled along its streets, and even the police walked with fear in their strides. The Bodie family lived in a small cottage on Coher Street off Ogie Park. Varnia Bodie was a simple cobbler who had a comfortable business near the market district and rode his bicycle daily from his shop to his home. Usually he would come home for dinner and then bike back for a few more hours at his workbench. Not this night. His wife, Katerina, insisted that he stay home. And when he objected, saying, I am a man, I will be fine. And I have my tool bag and hammer with me, my kitten. She shot back, but I and Ivanka would be here alone, and we are not. He could not argue with that. So the three, father, mother, and five-year-old daughter, were sitting in the fire, by the fireplace later that evening after a full meal and enjoyed unexpected family time, reading when a knock came at the door. Who would it be at this hour? Katerina asked. We shall see, kitten, Varnia said. He put his newspaper aside and went to his tool belt, from which he snatched up his hammer and walked to the door. Who is it? Varnia called. There was no answer save a second knock, more insistent this time. The cobbler looked at his wife, who shook her head. Go to your room, Ivanka, Katerina whispered. But Mama, go. The blonde girl rose, recognized her mother's tone of do as I say or else tone. So she closed her book and went into the back. Who is it? Varnia called louder at the door. This time his admonition was met with silence. When the cobbler moved to unlatch the door, his wife jumped up and stopped him. No, it, it could be some sort of trick. But what if it is someone who needs help? No, they, they could yell to us or, or knock again. I have to see, kitten. Vanya slid back the bolt despite a gasp from his wife. He raised his hammer over his head, eased the door crack, and glanced out. Varnia, Katerina whispered as she crossed herself. After a long moment, the cobbler pulled the door open, and his wife saw there was no one outside. He closed it quickly and rebolted it. I don't understand. Leave it, husband, and come to bed. This is not right. Mama, Ivanka called from the doorway to her room. The nice man was cold. The two parents turned to see a little girl holding the hand of a tall mustache figure dressed in black. She is very well mannered, the figure said. She invited me in to get warm. You should be very proud. Then the Wallachian prince smiled to reveal his fangs. 
and the killing began. A short time later in the book, after Gwendolyn has been captured, we join her in her cell. There was no day or night in Gwendolyn Harker's dank cell. She was fed porridge, bread, and cheese through a slot in the door, but a taciturn Romany who never answered any of her entreaties only returned her pleas for freedom with a noncommittal grunt or a stony look. Time lay heavy on her hands. With no way to mark its passage, she thought she might go mad from the silence. She wondered at prisoners who spent years incarcerated, and she began to play on her mind. She fought the panic of the thought that she might be locked up for a long time. Oh, Robert, she said as she sobbed in despair on the primitive bed. I was a fool. I should have waited for you to come with me. Her thoughts of the Texan brought a wry smile. She tried to do what he'd told her in one of their conversations. You got to focus when things are darkest on something light. It was all I could do in some days to put words to paper when Mama was dying. But she used to tell me, son, the hope is in the poetry, in the words. So that's what I've set my stock by, and it got me this far. So Gwendolyn set her mind to remembering a poem Bob had sent her in a letter. She visualized his words in his bold handwriting. He always wrote his letters longhand to make them more personal. And then recited one of them out loud, though she heard his voice when she did. Battle crow, my lover calls across the field of y'alls, where brandished swords and great shield walls are beckoning me fall. The bouquet that I send to her, a gift of precious life she craves. So lover, hold me in your arms, enfold me in your wings, transport me to the drinking hall to sup with warrior kings. Bravo! The voice of her captor startled the prisoner from her reverie. Her captor was a thin older man, yet he stood upright and projected an animal vitality despite his long white hair. He had a narrow, sharp, cheekboned face with long white mustache, pointed ears, and displayed sharp teeth when he smiled. He had a hooked nose and a pointed salt and pepper beard with a clear streak of whiteness. His piercing eyes were like burning orbs staring at her from the small window in the cell door. They are proud words, warrior words. Whose words are they? She shot to her feet and set her shoulders back, announcing with pride, they are the words of Robert Irvin Howard of America, Prince. He is, he is my friend. Ah, the captor said, his voice well aged like wine. A precious gift of life. He laughed softly. <laughs> it is good your friend understands life and death so clearly, for to understand them is to value both. He was the one you sent the papers to in Paris. She gasped. How? The captor laughed softly. <laughs> it is I who rule here. The power of his statement was such that the girl stepped back from the door as if physically assaulted. I am Vladir, Prince of Wallachia, and I honor my father's position in the Order of the Dragon. So I am called Dracula. It was I who drove the Turkmans out of my country, who brought the arrogant aristocrats of Wallachia to heel. I am Evode, a prince of my people, and you will give me deference, English intruder. Of course, Lady Harker, who is not Harker, I know all that goes on in my domain. I do not know what you sent, but once I knew who you were, I had you watched. My fool agent did not stop the packages you sent, but he did find out for whom they were destined. Fortunately, I have agents in many places. I can tell you that your poet received the packages. Gwendolyn felt the savage energy of the man through the door, but her fear gave way to indignation, so she fell back on an upbringing among nobility. You, you did not have him harmed. Ha ha ha! His laugh was like an animal growl. My Paris-based Romany agents failed to obtain the package, and he was lucky, this poet. He escaped with them. So far, they have lost track of him. Now it was Gwendolyn who laughed a laugh with hope in it. <laughs> he will not stop until he finds me. 
you have much faith in this poet. Trust me, madam, I do not fear poets. You should, she said. He is not all what most think him to be, and he is from Texas. And you'll have to find out what happens to Bob Howard and Dracula by getting a cowboy in Carpathia, my award-winning book. Thank you. That's so cool. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much for sharing. For sharing. That was neat. Um, I, I think of you as the person who knows the most about how, Bob Howard of anybody I know. So can you tell us a little bit about what Bob Howard meant to you? Why? why? Oh, he, he and oh, Peter O'Donnell and Edgar Rice Burroughs and Dashiell Hammett are the voices I hear in my head. Robert E. Howard wrote uh, Conan the Barbarian. Mm -hmm. He wrote Solomon Kane, Cormac MacArt, Bran MacMorn, um, many adventure stories set in historical periods and in his magically created Hyborian Age, which was somewhere after the sinking of Atlantis and before recorded time. Uh, he was a correspondent with H.P. Lovecraft, but he, he didn't start selling professionally until he was about 20. And he killed himself in a car outside of his mother's hospital where she was dying when he was 30 mm -hmm. in 1936. So um, he is, um, it's astounding the amount of wordage he created. He was a mainstay of weird tales. He created the sword and sorcery genre. There had been other stories that had sorcery or had warriors or historical adventures. Um, H. Ryder Haggard had written a, a Norse saga. Well, he's the first one who said, I'm going to take these elements and combine them in a way that hasn't been combined before. And literally everyone from J.R. Martin to J.R. Tolkien, who actually liked Bob Howard and said so in an interview, um, owes a debt to his ability to give grounded reality to these fantasy worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fantasy. It's fascinating also to think that he lived in his his small town in Texas and never went anywhere, and yet he's writing all these amazing adventures all over the world and other worlds. Well, right? he, he was one of those kids who literally he used to sneak into the library during the summer when they were closed, steal books, read them, and bring them back. And the librarians probably knew it and didn't care because he always brought them back in great condition. But he was an avid reader, an avid historian. His letters to um, to H.P. Lovecraft alone are, are educations in in history, genealogy, um, weapons, culture. It's astounding. He mm -hmm. was so brilliant. He was only trapped by poverty, and um, but it's interesting. He'd stopped writing Conan at least a de oh, I would say six years before he died. He was already onto historical stuff, and his education as a person and as a writer had already eclipsed a lot of his earlier sort of narrow views. Um, if he'd had even five more years, it's astounding to think what he might have done. So I gave him some of those years in A Cowboy in Carpathia, and um, there's a sequel book coming out called A Cowboy and a Conqueror, which should be out later this year from Pro Se as well. Uh, and he meets some other interesting people in that book. Oh, cool. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. This is an award-winning book, as you said, the Pulp Factory Award for Best Novel. Just uh, very unexpected. It happened literally last week. Uh, same day that my John Shadows book, Killing Shadows, came out. So for about four days, I wandered around bumping into furniture more <laughs> than usual uh, in, in sort of a, a, a fugue state. Um, truly astounded. I uh, had such nice words from people. But... It's, you know, it's a form I put my heart in and uh, it's nice to see it appreciated by some people. Uh, uh, all right, Sp speaking of uh, being embarrassed and such, I'm gonna embarrass you now. Uh, this got a great review from Ron Fortier who is well known in the pulp, uh, in the pulp world. And he says about your book, every so often a book comes along that is so pulp it reverberates his fact gloriously on every single page. 
from inception to execution and finally in print, it proudly tells the reader that this is what true pulp fiction is all about. A Cowboy in Carpathia is such a book. It's the kindest words I could ever hear from anyone. I've respected Ron's writing for uh, 25 years. He wrote the incredible series of comics for uh, uh, on the Green Hornet back in the 80s and has just written everything since. Um, no, it's, it's a real honor to hear those words. But see, one of the problems is most people think pulp, uh, and it has nothing to do with Tarantino's pulp fiction, which has nothing to do with pulp, um, is a specific genre, and it's really not. The only thing that is not pulp is boring writing. Um, the pulp, There were pulps for romance, for steam engines, for race cars, for sports, for cowboys, for... Uh, adventure for horror. Um, it was. It referred to the paper that it was printed on, and it was entertaining writing, is what it 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 was. Um, and most of the great science fiction writers and fantasy writers we think of, like uh, Burroughs, um, Ray Bradbury, um, uh, Travis McGee's writer uh, McDonald, all started in the pulps because that's where you sold stories. Uh, the slick magazines that paid a little bit more tended to be the sort of the stodgy, more literary magazines. But even then, um, you know, the saint started as a pulp character and jumped to the stodgy magazines to get a little bit more money. Um, so it was the, it was always the case. So it's it's interesting. The new pulp community uh, is just starting uh, in the last ten to fifteen years is kind of being recognized. I do have to say one thing. Um, one of the stalwarts of the industry, uh, Derek Ferguson, who I've known online uh, and who's been incredibly encouraging and a mentor to many people, passed away April 4th. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just got the word today. Um, and he was one of the, the new shining lights in New Pulp. So um, uh, if, you know, I can just put that word out there that. Um, He's he's in the ether now and he's with us all, but um, he was an amazing person and anyone who had any interaction with him felt enriched by it. So um, I feel blessed to have at least had some contact with him. Mm -hmm. And his, his Dylan books are great as well. Yes, I, I was so sorry to hear. Yeah. Well, you know, you, the, the comments you're talking about, the pulp industry kind of leads us right into a nice question from Nancy. She wants to know, what's your favorite genre to write? I know you write many. Um, I, as you know, you've heard me talk many times. I don't know what the hell I write um, because I literally switch um, from one to the other. I, I, I always think of myself as an adventure writer, but I write adventure horror, adventure paranormal, adventure sword and sorcery. Uh, mm -hmm straight up historical adventure, alternate world adventure. Um, I, I think that's a little bit of everything in there. I I, I don't know. Um, the only thing I really haven't written is um, is math textbooks because that would be a horror. Um, you know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair. Any equations that came out of it would be fantasy. Um, I think um, I lean toward, I guess, paranormal adventures because um, I do... Uh, historical stuff, then, and, and I, by being a little paranormal, I can bend the actual history a little and not have to be super accurate. Um, yes, yes. But I mean, John Shadow's book, the, the Killing Shadows, is a straight up noir thriller, martial arts thriller, uh, a, a noir martial arts noir, I like to call it. And uh, Cowboy in Carpathia is a weird adventure um, set in the '30s. So. Um, but the thread be in all of it is hopefully you keep turning the page. Um, yeah. In yeah. all of it. Yeah. I, I mean, Bob Howard and Dracula. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, pretty much all you have to say. Um, and a lot of poetry. One of the nice things is both fantasy and the Bob Howard books give me a chance to write a lot of poetry uh, yeah. because you can fit them in the story. Yes. Okay. We have a, uh, 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 oh, Nancy also says the flip side of that is you could make math books fun. No shade on the folks who already love math. <laughs> <laughs> but they would immediately be fantasy. As soon as I got near it, you ain't seen my checkbook. No. Or, or bizarro, bizarro, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Magical well, realism in, in, in accounting. 
Randy had a good question, and you're going to laugh at this one. Rather play a good guy or a bad guy? I would love to play a good guy. In 42 years in the business as an actor, I have played a good guy twice. And once it was because it was a, a scenario at a Renaissance fair. I've done 60 Renaissance fairs where they, they wanted the audience to, to vote on who is the killer. And they wanted me because everyone would vote that I was the bad guy. And that's one of the two times I've ever played a good guy. So um, you killed them all. <laughs> I, have, I have killed everyone. Every <laughs> single one of them. I have devoured their souls. Um, <laughs> one thing about playing a bad guy is um, I've often said good guys often dither. They worry that they're doing the right thing. Bad guys don't care. So bad guys are very definitive. But okay. you can always tell in a movie who's a good guy and who's a bad guy because the good guys talk like this all the time and they're very straightforward. But bad guys always pause. And that's how you can tell who's a bad guy in any movie. They, they pause a lot because they want you to appreciate their evil. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, um, last question is from, from Alp, who was first asking, when did you start writing? But now she says, better yet, when did you begin to think of yourself as a writer and what set it off? I have always written. I wrote, I have notebooks with comic strips in them in grammar school. And I wrote a, um, a novella while I was in high school in a summer class. And it eventually got published, actually. Um, I have... I've always thought of myself as a writer or a storyteller, but um, I was sick in the early 2000s. I'd already written a couple of books by then that I hadn't sold, of course. Um, and I made the decision that well, I should move in that direction because eventually I can always fall down, but eventually I won't get up. Um, and uh, which every stuntman comes to that decision. I used to get hit five times a day with cars when I was teaching at a stunt school. and. Um, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. So here I am some 20 years later, and I've written 40 novels. Uh, I don't know. A couple, I've, I number my stories. I've got 502 numbered stories in my um, – I keep a record book of, of my various stories. And number 482 uh, on, uh, and because it's the only way I can keep track of them. And – I'm hoping someday I'll be a, a writer or um, I'm a storyteller now. And every day it's about trying to get better at the craft um, because I don't think you ever stop learning at anything. I mean, that's my martial arts background says that you don't, you don't, you, you don't get to a point where you go, good, done. I know everything. Um, not until we're nailing you in and you're trying to kick your way out going, no, I got a couple more minutes, please. Um, so, um, but I, I've always known I wanted to, but um, actually the internet and this stuff allowed me to be able to do it more. And, um, mm -hmm. and now I devote a, a good deal of my time to it. I'm essentially semi-retired from acting and stunt work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I am uh, just going to close out by saying you, sir, are a writer. So thank you for sharing your words. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. I'll see you all a little bit. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Teal. I'm going to introduce our last reader, Randy Dawn. Randy Dawn writes about the glam world of entertainment by day and fantastical, fic fantastical fictional worlds at night. Her short stories have been published in outlets and anthologies, including Dim Shores, Children of a Different Sky, Where We May Wag, Fantasia Divinity, and Samhain Secrets. She's the co-editor of Across the Universe, Tales of Alternative Beatles, and co-author of the Law and Order SVU Unofficial Companion. She resides in Brooklyn, New York, surrounded by her brilliant spouse, her fluffy Westie, many books, and never enough mangoes. More at randydawn.com. Randy? I'm 
grooving along that little tune. Thank you so much for that introduction, Carol, and thank you, James and Carol, for coordinating all of this. Uh, my name is Randy Dawn, and I'm going to read from you, read to you from a story I wrote called Rough Beast Slouching. It is a new novelette of mine that you can find in this book, Dim Shores Presents Volume 2 from the spring. Uh, hopefully there'll be a link to it in the chat. Uh, so click on that link, grab your copy. There's a lot of other great stories in there, dark fiction, horror. You'll be totally into it. So where I'm picking up in the novelette that I wrote, um, we're talking about, we're seeing things from the perspective of Nervada Sullivan. She's a tabloid writer who's fallen for a guitarist named Kat, whose band Blue Puka is on the rise to the big time. Uh, in part, though, that's because of a mysterious, possibly malignant follower that they've attracted named Shiri. Uh, at some point, they will refer to a book in this little segment. It's actually a real book, Folklore and Fairy Tales of Ireland by W.B. Yeats. So, Blue Puka played that night, even after the fracas. But somehow, it just don't mean anything to say that Puka played. Soon as, so, soon as those first chords started up, everybody peeled off the bar stools and peeled across the room, locked in place like before. Didn't even take our beers. I swore I'd never watch him live again, not after that first time, but I was hooked. For one thing, I couldn't walk out on Cat again, but for another, the music had me in its claws from note one. I stood in the back corner, trembling and horny, then ashamed and totally sapped after. The whole set, I was lost to the sounds. There was a funny little silence as the last chord faded out and everybody stirred at once, like we were coming out of thrall. The clapping and the hooting rose up in a wave until it was too loud to do anything else. I checked my watch. They played for 45 minutes. It felt like five years. One minute they were on, the next they weren't, and the time between them was both enormous and tiny. The show was time travel. I wanted to see Cat just then, see if the music still hurt, and if it did, why we kept coming back for more. But I waited. Scott taught me it's best leaving the band be for a couple of minutes after a show. It's intense. Their ears are ringing. They're having a moment just to come down. Not that you come all the way down for hours, he told me, but in the real raw first breaths after a show, you're a wire wound way too tight. You got to return to the real world. A cold hardness pressed up against my back, and I whirled around, hair all pricked up in my, in, in my throat like I'd swallowed a golf ball. Beer? asked Shiri. She held two bottles pinched between narrow fingers, and I took one mechanically. Guinness. That's what I like, she purred, a woman who isn't afraid of the dark. I can describe Shiri. That's what I do for a living but you can't know what it's like to be there with her, with those eyes trained on you only. The closer she got, the more I felt things, felt everything. With her right there, taking delicate sips off the beer neck like she was having tea in a Victorian ladies' parlor, I was focused on the hardwood of the floor under my boots, the, slick, the sick little AC breeze making its way into our corner, the trickle of sweat sliding down my back. But it wasn't about feeling the here and now. I got this tightness in my gut that reminded me of being in love for the first time, how desperate and hopeless and unlikely it all was. There were all the girls I didn't approach out of fear and the boys I faked it with for the same reason. It was like that needle I felt earlier with the music was back and this time it was slipping into my soul and letting it escape gasp by gasp. You're a woman men fight over, I said. She smiled and a furnace turned on in my belly. Then it went lower. Not always men, she said, not always fighting. I'll bet, I said. So what are you then? She cocked her head and chuckled. Ooh, she murmured, and her smile stretched almost too wide. Can't we merely agree that I am a muse to Jordan, as I was before him to others? Muse don't seem the right word. Tisn't she said, but you are less familiar with the right words than your mother was, true? A breeze tickled the back of my neck and my curls felt stiff beneath the inv invisible caress. 
Mentioning Ma proved I wasn't just standing next to some strange chick. There was magic, real magic in here, and it was terrifying. I'd also felt like I'd just seen the world show its face for the first time. Shiri finished her bottle of beer, then released her grip on it. It hung in midair, wobbling. The dark glass caught the light and sent shards of bright dancing around the room. I stood there breathing the same air as her. Was this what Jordan felt when he was with her? Was it what, was it what Manx's singer did before he went swimming? Maybe. But there was something different too, something more. I thought again about how with great bands, you either want to be the lead singer or you want to fuck the lead singer. I looked at Shiri and I knew which one I wanted. I bet you're a fascinating moonshore, I said, the word sliding like water from me, Ma's word. Her face brightened and the bottle spun harder. She clapped her hands together once. Oh, Nevada Sullivan, you are delightful, she said. I have been called many things, but I don't suppose I've ever been considered a teacher. Then she went thoughtful, but perhaps I could be. My throat caught. What is coming next? I asked for Jordan, for Kat. She winked at me. Ah, now that would be telling, she said. Do tell. In exchange for what? Depends, I said. What do you want? Just then the dressing room door burst open and I felt Shiri not exactly vanish but become not there. The bottle fell to the floor and shattered. Jordan ran out first carrying a flopped out cat in his arms. She had one hand curled at her chest and the other dangling down. Her eyes flipped open at me. Get me out of here. She said in a creaky old voice, help. Behind me, I heard jangling laughter like bracelets clanking. And like that, they were all gone. Oh, not gone, gone, not with Cambridge Hospital around the corner. Cat was laid up in the sick room for a long while till they figured out it was some kind of undiagnosed heart valve weakness. Told her she had to rest up or she'd need slicing open. I took to visiting every couple of hours, every couple of a couple of hours every day, and when she asked, I read her stories. Sometimes we talked, sometimes I brought her strong hot tea. We learned plenty. Took me about a week of doing that to realize I hadn't thought of Ma and her nightmarish hospital sickbed once the whole time. But the others did vanish pretty quick, and by that I mean Blue Puka and Shiri. Band got signed and then they hit the road playing all over the country. Cat was out, couldn't travel, couldn't do what they needed doing, so they sacked her with all the grace of a bag of rocks to the head. That meant I had places to be, job, Cat's apartment. I started sleeping over. We were a thing. For a long time, that was all I had to pay attention to. I liked the road I was on. Things were, well, balanced. I kept reading her stories, and damnedest thing about that book, you know, the stories weren't happy, dappy, crappy fairy tales with the bow tied in the knot at the end. The little folk have all kinds of names in his book and none of them make you think of Tinkerbell. The one that stuck out with me was this fey creature who inspired the poets while sucking the life out of them. Cat perked up when she got to that part of the book. It's not the whiskey that kills them young, she said in a soft voice propped up with pillows on her ratty old sofa. It's the she. That word, Irish for fairy, sounded a lot like Shiri. When I pointed that out, Kat started crying. Jordan, she said, I worry for him every day. I gave her a hug. The last thing I wanted was her bawling over some ex-boyfriend, especially when part of me wasn't all that sympathetic. Jordan was a grown-up. He knew what he was getting into, or should have. You didn't have to let a thing like, tra like Shiri trap you, not if you weren't greedy. And you, and you could stop thinking with your dick. That was not a problem for me, you see. I asked Kat later what was going on in the dressing room right before she collapsed. And she said she and Jordan were having it out. She decided after that show to confront him finally, ask what the hell was going on. Cause he never wrote songs like that before, she said. You know, when you got Beethoven in front of you from note one, that's not him. She snorted. He just gave me a pat on the head and said, found my muse is all. Next thing I knew, I was down on the floor and my heart felt like a rock. Figures I crap out during our first fight in five years. Then there came the day when we put the books aside and she asked me to read from my local rag. 
She wanted to hear my stories. I told her it was just local muck and ugly, nothing to share. Can you write about things that are uplifting? She asked. Suppose, I grumbled, but ugly sold papers, and I like having my hands dirty. The ugly feels right when I'm pawing through it. But I didn't have those words to explain, not to someone sweet like Kat. We were flipping through the paper one afternoon to find a story of mine when we stumbled on a full page ad for Blue Puka's upcoming tour. Kat leaned over me and was half in my face, trying to see it up close. The picture had us mesmerized. The band was posing in a school play yard with Jordan front and center, all rock star cool. He was slim and trim, clean shaven with a fire in his eyes that transmitted clear through newsprint. The others were flat images, but his popped in three dimensions. He was almost glowing. Well, I said softly, seems like Shiri is doing her job. We turned to each other, noses touching. There was this electric crackle. In a low, husky growl, she said, I don't want to talk about her. We had other things to do instead. So this story, again, appears in Dim Shores Presents, Volume 2. There's a lot of other terrific dark fantasy and horror stories in there, and the link to buy it is in the chat. Or you can go over to my website, randydawn.com, and check out the book listings. Thank you so much for giving me part of your Friday. I really, really appreciate you uh, listening. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you for sharing your story with us. My pleasure. Very nice reading. Thanks. My, my light went out about halfway through. Oh, you know, I thought something flickered and it went wasn't out of batteries. Okay. <laughs> Technical difficulties. That's yes, okay. indeed. <laughs> it wouldn't be a galactic terrors if something minor and almost unnoticeable didn't go wrong. Oh, good. Nobody knows. This is right. good. So, so just, just how glam really is the world of entertainment? <laughs> Uh, well, it does a good, it puts, it puts on a good show, literally and figuratively. Um, you know, to me, the, the, the less glam parts are the more fun parts, the ones where you get to go behind the scenes and see how the, how the sausage gets made, as they like to say. It's, uh, it, it gives you a new perspective and new appreciation for what ends up on the screen. But what I found is that the longer that I've done this, the more I do see on the screen, I sort of mentally break it down in my head. I'm like, oh, that character's wearing red in that scene, so she's going to be an important character. And it's almost like the story gets told to me before the story is getting told to me. So sometimes it's better not to always know all the ingredients of the sausage. Right. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you, once once you see all of the uh, the markers that really have meaning mostly behind the scenes, right? Then it, it starts to spoil things for you. Well, but it, yeah. I guess I guess glam is a good good way to describe it then, because it's you know short for glamour. Mm -hmm. And yes. it ties in nicely to the uh, the she element in your story because the you know the the uh, the little people are known for their glamour their glamour they are they, they are know. and if I can throw something in here real quick I don't know no nobody asked if I'm going to throw this in anyway <laughs> that book and that character was what really got me into Irish folklore in the first mm -hmm. place and fairy tales and all that all I'd ever heard of was you know Lucky Charms or the stuff that you just grow up with. And after reading that book is sort of when I got inspired to write this kind of story. I have a longer version of this story as well. Um, and what I learned years later is that Yates, who went around the country and gathered all these stories together for the book, he, he basically made that character up out of whole cloth. There is no sort of succubus character in Irish hmm. folklore. Um, he was, you know, not, he was of the gentry. He was not of the people, but he was trying to get the people's story. He was kind of, he was doing cultural appropriation. Let's put it that way. Uh, long before anybody necessarily called it that. And he just kind of threw that in there because it just seemed like it should fit. And, um, but I love it so much. I'm like, oh, no, I got to put that in there. I got to, I got to keep this story going. I love this character. That's cool. That's an interesting background for the character. Mm -hmm. So, um, now that you have sort of gotten into uh, Irish mythology or fo and folklore, do you find that you're going back to that for other stories and for more inspiration? Um, sometimes. Okay. Uh, like I say, I took Shiri and I have a novel length story with a different band that she is involved with. Um, that story has not been sold anywhere, so no, no point in looking for it. But yes, I have. I wrote a whole book and then this version came out much later. Um, and I have used other fae characters from Scottish and Gaelic uh, um, folklore for other stories. Um, I have one that I just recently sold that uses um, a Scottish uh, man of the forest story um, that I've sold, but I can't say where yet 
Okay. Hopefully it'll be out later on in the year and I'll have more information. You can look on my website. And when I can say things, I will say things. Excellent. All right. So we have a quite a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Alt Beck would like to know if you prefer writing fiction or nonfiction. Um, you know, the thing is that I, 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 I got into nonfiction so that hopefully I could afford to write fiction because <laughs> fiction does not pay very well unless you're really, really successful. Um, but I, I like long forms of nonfiction. I've done profiles of bands, of um, you know, actors. And when I can do thousands of words, when I can write 2,000, 3,000 words and you get access to this person for more than 15 minutes at a time, that almost, I'm not saying I write a fictionalized version of it, but it's, it's like telling a story. You get all these different facts and bits of information and you, you create this, uh, this profile, this psychological, this career profile of this person. And I really have loved, I love doing that. Unfortunately, with the rise of the internet and short bits that you can read on your phone, there's a lot less long journalism going on anymore. Um, so I would definitely say at the moment, fiction. Okay. But, yeah. And and part two of that question, you may have already somewhat answered, which is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's a lot of fun to meet people and talk to famous people who I admire or whose work that I admire. So that's actually a lot of fun. R writing is fun in a way that I think is, is personally satisfying. I think it's, it's fun for the soul when it works well, but I think it is maybe less fun, less fun more frequently because there's so much other stuff, rewriting, somebody editing it, somebody not accepting it for a publication. You know, there's a lot of not fun stuff, but when you, it's more pure fun, I think, when you, when you get to the fun bits. Okay. Hey, you know, and just, uh, just a question that popped into my head, I'm curious about, have you ever met anybody, uh, any celebrities or, or creative people that you've covered for nonfiction purposes that um, wound up in your fiction, either for good or bad reasons? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, especially, well, I did a lot of music journalism and um, you can, might be able to tell that from this story. And I was definitely inspired by people that I met when I was writing this initial story and also when I write the longer version. Um, but then you write and you rewrite and you rewrite and rewrite and they become your own characters. But I wrote this story many years ago when I was doing uh, journalism in the Boston music scene, like in the 90s. So like a generation ago already. And the, 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 the band is sort of inspired, at least some of the people in the band are inspired by some of the people that I knew at the time. So yeah, you know, nobody's safe around a writer. Right. <laughs> All right, uh, Carol asks, did your media interviews influence your perception of these characters? And so that sort of, you know, follows on to what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I'm not in a band. I don't write music. That is something that is sort of beyond my ken. I can write really stupid songs, you know, just riffing on something. Um, I, I've got a novel where I made up a, an homage to a mango, you know, and that's in there. But that's not really a song. So music is not my forte. I am an admirer. So um, getting to talk to these people and see what it's really like behind, like the experiences for them. There's a line that I read tonight about, you know, you don't just go up to the band right after the show. You got to let them decompress a little. You got to let them, you know, come down a bit from that high. Um, that was something that I learned by hanging out with bands, by talking with them, by, by being backstage. So absolutely, this, you know, that, that's my research. People talk about you got to research to be able to write about it. That is the research that I've done. Absolutely. That's great. All right. And just one more question from our audience. Alp again is asking, what do you wish people would ask you? <laughs> I wish they would ask me if I'm open to a multi-book publishing deal for six <laughs> figures. That's what I really wish they would ask me. Um, but, you know, it, you just meet me in person and you ask me how I'm doing. I'm totally fine. You know, ask me what, ask me what I'm writing about, because as with almost any writer, that is the question you want to be asked. You want to know what your story is about. You want to know where they can get it. So uh, that I think is what I think I want people to ask me. Yes, exactly. Where can I buy your book? Right, precisely. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Well, thank you so much, Randy. I think we're going to bring uh, the rest of our crew back on and have a little wrap up and, and find out what everyone is, is coming up with uh, in the near future. So let's bring everyone back. 
All right. Thank you all for your readings tonight. Really fantastic. Uh, I enjoyed them. I hope our audience did as well. I'm sure they did. And uh, really terrific stories and a really exciting mix of stories tonight. Yeah, I loved hearing everybody's stuff. I mean, you know, I, I, I couldn't comment at the time in the comments section, but I wasn't just sitting or not listening. It was great. I and mean, I really enjoyed everybody's stories, really different stories and really different approaches. And I loved uh, working poetry in there too. Yes. For National Poetry Month, yes. Yeah, yes. thank you, Amy, for bringing, uh, bringing cl classing up the uh, the session a little bit with some poetry. <laughs> it's always classy, but you're welcome, Jim. It was more poetic this time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, poetry and machine guns. How can you go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Doc, quick. All right. So uh, I would we'd love to hear what you all have coming up next. And why don't we just go back to Ryan, uh, who was our first reader. And Ryan, I think you are yep. muted. Oh, oh, good. Oh, good. There we go. All yeah, right. might have been me. Um, yeah. So a uh, couple of things coming up. You uh, mentioned National Poetry Month, um, being married to an obsessive poet. Um, mm -hmm. She's writing a whole bunch of stuff right now, um, and we're re releasing as much as we can on social media. Um, what we're doing is we're doing readings together, reading by ourselves. Um, I've got a recording booth in the house, so really good audio and, and really uh, really fun stuff going on there. So um, yeah, either on on space and time or just our, our Facebook profiles, just keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you see any video things with weird stuff going on, it's probably uh, poetry. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's. Uh, coming up in the next month, um, I am currently working on a uh, an audio book um, for Lee Murray. If anybody knows uh, Lee Murray, um, she has uh, her her new new novel um, of short stories, uh, grotesque uh, monster stories. Um, so I'm I'm having a little bit of fun with that right now, trying to pronounce a whole bunch of French and native Maori words. So that's awesome, you know. That's uh, that's very good. She she when she was commissioning me, she's just like, yeah. And here's uh, here's some dictionary uh, um, references, so you can write in like every third word of this particular story and see how to pronounce it correctly. So that's that's one thing. Uh, my my wife pronounces words incorrectly in the English language, so that's why I'm <laughs> the one that does the. Uh, does the reading, but uh, yeah, hopefully that'll be out soon. Um, that's doing really well uh, uh, in the HWA right now. That's that's up there and it's it's doing its thing. So congratulations to Lee, and then hopefully we'll have an audiobook version of that out on Audible. You know, towards the end of the year, depending, it takes about two to three months to get anything processed through that right now. So yeah. that's fun and games, but uh, that's what's keeping me busy as well as uh, yeah, publishing the magazine. We have uh, yeah, one forty one coming up soon. Um, some really, really great stories. I'm really excited with the uh, the, the talent that we've got right now. Um, everybody during the pandemic kind of switched off when it came to stories. There was no scary stuff. That everything was uh, kind of tamped down. But now we've got some more scary stuff, some more adventure. We've got a little bit of lighthearted uh, uh, stories coming in there as well. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to have that one that one coming out soon. That's great. That's yeah. Great. And uh, we, uh, we do know Lee. Lee was uh, a reader on Galactic Terrors, I think back in January, mm -hmm. was it, Carol? Yes. And, yeah. uh, and also uh, Ryan's wife, Angela Eureka Smith, was just a reader with us yeah. as well. So both of those shows are available on our YouTube channel uh, uh, in the archive. So folks yeah. can go back and watch those if they want. As this one will be probably by tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and that's great. So lots of stuff to look forward to from you, Ryan. Mm. Nice. Um, Amy, what do you have coming up? I have sold another poem to the Under Her Skin anthology coming out next year from Black Spot Books. So I'm excited about that. Congrats. Stuff. And I sold a six word story that I can mention now since I signed the contract with Microverses. So uh, six word story. story. Wait a minute. Yeah. Six words. Six words. Story. Wait a minute. I, that's more words than the story. Oh. <laughs> like, like Hemingway wrote one, uh, baby shoes ne for sale, never worn, I think. Yes. Um, mine mm. is um, actually in keeping with the cannibalism theme. Because oh. why not? <laughs> it's, it's titled Hungry for More, but I'm, I'm not going to share the, uh, the whole no, thing. No, no, no. Gotta wait. 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 Yeah. 
Amy, I just have to say, you're coming over to my house for a barbecue, babe, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, if she asks me if, uh, to go out for a bite, I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm invited to that barbecue, I'm going to stick to the salad. <laughs> New experiences for everyone. <laughs> yes, true. Oh my gosh! Well, that's great, Amy. I mean, six words—is that considered flash fiction, or is that something, some other form, or isn't it uh, travel? Micro fiction is, yeah. is micro, yeah. Micro, yeah. even shorter than flash fiction. Not to be too profound, but I think yeah. that's what they call it. Yeah, I'm 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 always happy if I come in under six thousand words on a short story. So six words to <laughs> yeah, me right. is sort of like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a um flash of inspiration, literally. And I went with it. So that's great. Yeah, thank you. And Teal, what do you have uh on the horizon? Um well the uh the artist because uh the John Shadows book has illustrations. This publisher has illustrations in every book. The illustrators already started on the second book. Um so hopefully that'll be out later in the year. But I have um, the Skull Mask Chronicles coming out from Bold Venture Press. Somewhere in the next month or two, I, I haven't gotten the cover yet, so okay. that's happening. And then the sequel to Cowboy and Carpathia will be out late summer, early fall. Um, so uh, a, a, a Cowboy and a Conqueror. Um, and uh, I'm doing a zombie takeover on the zombie army on Monday. <laughs> And Sunday, I am taping the behind the scenes for a, a horror movie, a martial arts horror movie called Blood Mix that comes out, uh, it's released in September, red carpet in May, that is being um, distributed by Wesley Snipes' uh, <laughs> company, where I, I play the ghost slave owner bad guy who haunts the hero through the whole movie. Oh, nice. It is the most despicable role I've ever played, and what this was grown for. I had to regrow it. I shaved it off during the pandemic. I had to regrow it because we're doing behind the scenes. So um, I will probably have to have plastic surgery when the film is released. So <laughs> Best type of characters. Yeah, it's, uh, he's not a very pleasant fella. <laughs> well, that's all right. That's, that's you know, you, you can. Uh, exercise all those demons and devils uh in well, the character the worst part of it is when he said uh you know he's a he's a slave owner 17 uh 96 i said well what's the costume he said oh you got the clothes and i went yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I my own. you know me <laughs> you know that's the worst part but yeah i i do i do have the clothes so, all right well, well we'll keep an eye out for that it's called blood mix uh yeah uh yeah blood mix blood mix uh, great all right and Randy, what about you? Anything uh, we should be uh, keeping an eye out for? You know, I'm sitting on about three or four different things, right. not literally, of course. Uh, I'm sitting on several different things that I simply can't say, but um, I, I did sell, I sold a story to Horror for the Throne, I want to say at the end of 2019, but the thing is that it, they put it on hold during COVID, and I'm hoping that that will come out um, sooner rather than later. Um, I've got a story that's going to be coming out in a in an anthology, a themed anthology, but that's got that's going to Kickstarter pretty soon. Um, but I can't say which one yet. I have sold a ghost story that includes a dog to some very special people, but I can't talk about that yet either. Um, and what else? There's another story, like I mentioned earlier, about my uh, Green Man, uh, the Scottish Green Man, um, which again they haven't closed the submission process yet. So they said, don't say anything about it. So basically there's that. And then I have one really big thing that I wish I could be telling you about now, but I can't say anything because there's no ink on any paper yet, but I'm hoping that I will have a very large thing to talk about very soon. You're just going to have to come back and talk at us. That's oh it. yeah. We're going to have to institute a war <laughs> for you. All you folks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So oh, yeah, lots great. of things yeah, to talk no, I, about. It's not yet. I, I know, I know how you feel. I, that, that's been me the last several months too. Oh, yes, we're we're living in this purgatory of let us speak. Yeah. <laughs> so, but so. yes, no. Thank you for letting me keep my my muscles flexed and everything, so that I'm ready to take it on once these things drop. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, how, how about you, Jim? Anything anything you can share? I know you have some things that are not ready yet, but. Yeah, I, I, I have a bunch of bunch of things I'm not quite ready to share, but I, I was able to recently start announcing one project, which is a new anthology called Under Twin Sons, 
Alternate Histories of the Yellow Sign, uh, which I edited for Hippocampus Press. Awesome. And that will be coming out uh, this summer. Uh, they're all stories inspired by and set in sort of the, uh, the, the, the insane world of the King in Yellow, uh, as, as created by Robert W. Chambers in uh, The King in Yellow and The Yellow Sign, two of his short stories. So I I'm wonder excited about that. Anyone in this group might have a story in there. It's possible. <laughs> We ha have not announced all of the uh, contributors yet, so we're, oh, we're kind of teasing that about out. It, Jim. I don't know if they broke their confidentiality. I won't say who, but someone tweeted that they're in it. Oh, that's okay. No, that's right. We've started announcing the. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I want to know if 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 you picked that because of the same last name. You know, that's that's <laughs> what I was just been dying to ask you. <laughs> um, I, I you know I would say it was definitely a, a kind of a fun factor to it. And it, it didn't. It made it more interesting, and uh, it certainly has helped catch the interest of people who, uh, when I've talked about the project, they so you know everyone wants to ask me that question: Am I related to Robert W. Chambers? And uh, was there a reason that I I went with that project? Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a factor. And if you want to know if I'm related, you'll have to read my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. fair well, I have uh, some interesting things to share, uh, and it has to do with Heliosphere, because tomorrow, Saturday at Heliosphere, we have a panel on at noon called Horror 101. Uh, and it's sort of like for, for those folks who may have been more on the sci-fi side or the speculative side or whatever, who would like to know a little bit more about horror and different uh, different genres and you know things like that. And so I know Amy and, and Jim are on that as well, and I'll be moderating, and uh, some other folks as well. And then tomorrow night at seven o'clock through Heliosphere, we have a uh, reading for Hell's Mall. Amy has one there. I knew you would. There you go. Yes. yes. And there, there, there's the picture behind me. That side. Oops. Oh yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Th this is a, an anthology out from uh, Lefkadia Press that uh, many of us have uh, stories in from the HWA New York chapter, and we get to read a bunch uh, of them at tomorrow night at seven. So those of you who are already signed up for Heliosphere can just go find that in the schedule. And if you're not signed up for Heliosphere yet, please check it out because it's a really fun convention and it's free. You know, it's science fiction mm -hmm. and fantasy. And uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, and they have a, a large uh, filk contingent as well for those who are into filk, which is basically science fiction songs, if you don't know. But yeah, check out uh, Heliosphere, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it being back in person next year. Let, let's hope, let's hope, because yeah. it's a really fun little convention, and it's, yeah. and it's close to New York for those who are in the New York area. So, great. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We're so grateful for those of you who have uh, come to hear the readings and, and the Q and A's. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, please do subscribe to our Galactic Terrors YouTube channel if you have not already. Um, that will just give you, I think, an update in your email whenever we post a new broadcast uh, or schedule a new session. So that would be great if you wanna come back and we hope you will come back. Uh, thank you to our wonderful readers tonight, Ryan, Randy, Amy, Teal. Great job, we appreciate it. We love your stories and we're, we're so glad that you shared them with us tonight. Thank you very much for being great hosts. Yeah, thank you for, Thanks for having us. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank, Thank you to Helios here for, for joining up with us tonight. So, Thanks to everyone. All right. Have a great night, and we'll see you next month. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, everyone.